namens Inlea hartelijk welkom in de Martinikerk in Groningen. Ben ik goed te verstaan achterin? Goed. We zijn hier bij elkaar om de bewoners van Lampedusa te eren. We voelen ons verbonden met Lampedusa, maar we zijn op dit moment ook verbonden met de mensen van Lampedusa. Wat wij hier vanmiddag meemaken, wordt via livestream wereldwijd uitgezonden. Dus ook daar. Dus ik zeg, hello world. I would like to say welcome to the Martini Church in Groningen. We are gathered here to honor the good people of Lampedusa. And we have with us a very important um, resident of Lampedusa. It's, uh, it's your doctor, il dottore Pietro Bartolo. Benvenuto, dottore. Well done. Beautiful. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. And this is the living stone. And uh, this living stone, which is being awarded today, but we'll talk about the living stone later. For now, I would like to invite onto the stage Mr. Jan Egging. Please welcome Jan Egging. Thank you. Yeah. Jan Egging is chairman of the Inlia Foundation, the international network of local initiatives with asylum seekers. Is that right? Did I say it right? You said it correct, yes. Okay. That's uh, what uh, the, the name stands for. Um, yeah. The start of Inlia uh, uh, happened here in Groningen. Could you tell us something about that? Yes, Hanneke. In 1988, uh, the foundation was founded here in Groningen. Um, it is a, a network of uh, local uh, faith communities um, that undersigned a charter in which they uh, unite themselves uh, to stand for the sake of uh, asylum seekers. And now we are uh, a few years later. Uh, what about Inlia today? Well, today Inlia has uh, an office, uh, a service office here in, in Groningen. And here it's, uh, we have a knowledge center uh, to help the faith communities and the municipalities that face uh, uh, these uh, numbers of uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Would you want to say something more? Yes. Okay. Um, we are a service center and we, mm -hmm. we, we coordinate the, 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 the need of these asylum seekers. Uh, yeah. This event is dedicated to the people of Lampedusa, and especially to you, and to, but also to the people there. What is so special for Inlia, for, uh, about the people in Lampedusa? Yeah, what's uh, so special is that such a small community, it's even smaller than Schierm oh, Schiermonnikoog. Schiermonnikoog is a very small island in Holland. It has uh, less than uh, for about 6,300 uh, inhabitants. And in recent years, they received uh, around 300,000 uh, refugees. So that's immense. And nonetheless, they keep, although they keep on going, they do not see these people as, uh, they, they are not afraid of, of all these, uh, these foreigners, but they, they keep seeing them as human beings that need their help. And that's special. That is very special. Nowadays. Yes. Um, what is it you want to convey with the giving of an award to the people of Lampedusa? Uh, by this award, um, we want to thank all the people from Lampedusa who um, with, with their ongoing uh, dedication uh, for these refugees that keep on going. Um, and we want to express our deepest respect 
for the people who do this and, and show our uh, appreciation. And we hope that it may encourage them to go on with this uh, terrible, uh, difficult job. Right. Thank you very much. Jan Egging. Maybe we'll see each other later. Yeah. yeah. It does me great pleasure to introduce to you someone who has been involved with the plight of refugees for the past 25 years. Director of Amnesty International, Eduard Nazarski. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now one and a half year ago that I visited Lampedusa and spoke on the island to refugees, to people that support refugees and to officials. This was in a time that the European Union just had started the Operation Triton as follow-up to the Italian Mare Nostrum operation. The European Union had decided not to allocate the same level of resources as the Italians had been spending in search and rescue operations. And due to those budget cuts and the high number of persons... Ah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Due to those budget cuts and the high number of persons that tried to reach Italian shores, very many people were drowning. I was struck by the situation in the camp at Lampedusa, by the stories that refugees told me. They told me stories about the situation they had tried to escape, about the cruelties they had suffered when traveling to North Africa, about the merciless traffickers they had found and paid a lot of money in order to be able to embark on a small boat, and certainly also about the fears they had endured on the Mediterranean. When you are six hours out of the Libyan shore and waves are getting higher and higher, when you're getting very cold because of the night temperature and the water in the boat, when one side of the boat starts to deflate, when you're fighting to have a place on the assumed safe side of the boat, when you do not have any water anymore, or when your boat has capsized and you see how some of your fellow travelers are drowning and cannot do anything to help them. It was when documenting this situation with two Amnesty colleagues that I had the pleasure and the honor of meeting briefly with Dr. Pietro Bartolo. I was impressed when we met by the stamina, the resilience Dr. Bartolo showed, not so much in speaking, but in practice. And there were two things of this visit that I would like to mention specially. The first thing is that when we arrived in his office, we immediately saw one of the walls in the office, a picture of Dr. Bartolo and the Pope, or maybe I should say the Pope and Dr. Bartolo. Uh, Pope Francis had chosen as his first journey outside the Vatican to visit Lampedusa, a very powerful, important signal to the world, a very encouraging act for those who assist refugees and of course also for refugees themselves. Dr. Bartolo showed us the playroom for children where they could play during the time their mother was in a separate room for echo in case of pregnancy or for general diagnosis. This room was filled with toys and children could play there and come a bit at ease while their mother was somewhere else, but could take those toys with them to the camp after they left the hospital. And the citizens of Lampedusa made sure there were always enough new toys to accommodate new children. Major Giusy Nicolini told me later that the people in Lampedusa were indeed very supportive to refugees, despite the fact that tourism was going down on the island. But she also stated that she wanted the EU to step up and do more in order to help Lampedusa and also Italy, and not to leave the people of the island and Italy alone in their support for refugees. Well, we've seen now, after one and a half years, the EU has done a lot since then but unfortunately more aimed at deterring refugees than at protecting refugees. At this moment, there is, despite uh, all kinds of efforts of organizations, the EU seems to be more engaged in building walls, in building uh, fences, 
than in protecting refugees. And the EU seems to be in a mood for, closing, for doing agreements, for closing deals, first with Turkey and now also with Afghanistan and coming up with Tunisia, Senegal, Mali, Egypt and even Sudan, where the president is wanted by the International Criminal Court because of genocide and where Amnesty documented last week the use of chemical weapons against his own population. Ladies and gentlemen, I think Lampedusa in general, Dr. Bartolo in particular, are setting an example for Europe. Thank you. Eduard Nazarski, thank you. India has connections all over the world. We are going to look at a short film, and the name of the film is Greetings from All Continents. Good morning, We join you live from Indonesia. I wish you all well. Thank you. Greetings to the people of Groningen. This is Vinod from South India. I've heard stories of Lampedusa from the time we visited Groningen and it was really enriching and I'm sure that God will bless you immensely that you will be blessing to many 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 more people not just people who cross, the, cross your island but to the people of the entire world. Greetings to you once again and God bless you all. Hi, this is Vincent from Singapore. I'm sending you my greetings as you celebrate the lives and the people living in Lampedusa. God bless you all. Bye. They won't hear the applause, but let's give them an applause. <laughs> this very special award, the Living Stone, has been inspired by Peter's verse of the Living Stone. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you a member of the board of the Inlia Foundation, Reverend Bob Hanstra. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to tell you something about the India Award, the so-called Living Stone. Yes, and again this week is a prize, an award, the talk of the town of Groningen. The Living Stone as a kind of Nobel Prize. The Living Stone is a visible token of a great appreciation to the receiver of this award for helping refugees in desperate need for helping people under severe threat. Although it's a simply an ordinary brick, and contrary to the Nobel Prize, Dr. Batolo, you get no money for it. Still, it's a precious award. The living stone is a simply brick, is a stone with an inscription. The inscription refers to a text from the Bible. It's the text from the first letter of St. Peter, second chapter, the verses 4 and 5, saying, As you come to him, that's Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also live like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, it's a biblical command to us humans be living stones as Jesus was. Living stones together, building a house, a world of justice and peace. Living stones together, building a palace of brother and sisterhood of man. Living stones together, 
building a world in which asylum seekers and refugees are welcomed and helped. Yes, indeed, building a world without refugees. The living stone is a small price. There is no money involved, as thick as a brick, no more, no less, but still very costly and precious. It's Jesus who said, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, and you received me in your home. I was naked, sick, and in prison, and you took, took care of me. And those on the right hand said, when did we see you? And Jesus answered, you are blessed, because whenever you did this for one of the least important of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. In this way, the living stone is precious and costly. Later on this afternoon, the living stone will be given to two people of Lampedusa, also representing the people of Lampedusa, as a sign of great thanks and appreciation, as a tribute for them who dedicated their time, their life for people in need. Thank you. This week saw the premiere of the documentary Fuoco Amare, Fire at Sea. And a song featured in this documentary was performed on Lampedusa by the Lipadusa Band and will be introduced by the composer himself, and that's Paolo Martocci. I hope I say it right, dottore. Please don't be angry if I don't. Uh, but more is it, oh, no, very good. The, the introduction by Paolo Mar Marzocci is in, uh, in, in Italian, and Leonora, you will do the translation in Italian. So, applause for it. Leonora. I'm just a voice. No. Allora. Storia lunghissima, sarò molto sintetico. This is a very long Ero story. A Lampedusa per un progetto I will be very short. Ministero della Pubblica Istruzione. So we were working with the Ministry of Education. Concentrato sui bambini dell'isola, cioè l'isola raccontata. We were working with the children. Un racconto di parole. Of the island. E sono venuto in contatto con la Lampedusa Band. Ho so I came in contact with the musical band. La Madonna di Porto Salvo. I started to play music with them. And honestly, I found it so great working with these people that I couldn't leave anymore. We started to have meetings with the musicians of the band. We had nice dinners, we discussed, and we started to discuss about playing this music. So, I have learned to play with them, to play their music, and I noticed that we could modify a little bit the, one of the very famous songs of the island, and I modified the piece that so the tuba could play the main theme, and so here we are playing all together.
orchestra. That's a good orchestra. <laughs> when you read about the terrible stories that happen on Lampedusa, music is not the first thing that comes to your mind, but of course life goes on there as well. A sign of hope. Let us see this as a sign of hope. Well, we are about to witness the world's premiere of a very special piece of music, the oratorium Songs of Exile. For an introduction to this composition of Chris Victor, I would like to introduce Bishop of Rotterdam and President of the Episcopal Conference, Monsignor Hans van den Hende. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will listen to an oratorium named Songs of Exile, a composition consisting of words from the Book of Psalms, the Book of Psalms in which the Word of God has become the prayer of man. The Psalms of Exile remind us of the people of God being oppressed and brought to a foreign country being humiliated and persecuted, people without freedom by the rivers of Babylon. The words of the Psalms constitute an ongoing dialogue, a dialogue in which the depth of pain and despair can be heard, in which the depth of thirst and hunger can almost be felt, a dialogue in Situations of suffering and distress, expressing the thirst and hunger for justice and peace. We hear the prayers of people in need. They pray to the Lord with confidence, Lord, from the depth I call you, hear my cry. Lord, bring us back. And waiting for an answer, they ask their oppressors, how could we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? The Psalms of Exile not only remind us of people in despair long ago, these words also ask our attention for so many refugees in our present time, refugees fleeing war and hunger. Sure, in our days, the Lord will listen to their cry and prayers too. But do we ourselves open our hearts? Do we show mercy and compassion to one another? As living stones, are we able to build a civilization of love and solidarity? Pope Francis visited the island of Lampedusa in 2013. It was his first visit outside Rome. In the liturgy of Holy Mass at Lampedusa, Pope Francis used purple vestments. Purple is the liturgical color of repentance and penitence. And Pope Francis asked forgiveness for those who by their decisions at the global level have created situations that lead to the tragedy of refugees. During his homily, Pope Francis called the inhabitants of Lampedusa, helping the refugees, a living example of the gospel. More specifically, a living example of Matthew 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. As I said at the beginning, in the book of Psalms, the word of God has become the prayer of man. In light of the Gospel of Matthew, we have to emphasize also the cry of refugees in need has become the cry of the Lord himself. Thank you. The world 
premiere of the oratorium Songs of Exile. Let's welcome the musicians and the singers. beautiful organ here in the Martini Church will also be played by Jochem Schuurman. Uh, Anna Elise Touvenen will play the cello. Uh, the choir is called the Exile Chamber Choir, especially for this uh, uh, situation. The soloists, Marian van der Heide, Roelien van Wageningen, Jeroen Helder, Roele Kok, and the conductor is Geert-Jan van Beierenbergen. En heen gaan. Applaus voor dit hele bijzondere gezelschap. Special. And we hope you enjoy it too.
the composer of this beautiful piece, Chris Victor. of this wonderful piece and I wondered this is the first time it's it's the world premiere and you are sitting there you can do nothing it's horrible 
<laughs> but it's exciting, really. It's, it's a miracle when you hear your music. First you hear it here, then you write it down, then you give it as a child away, yeah. and then waiting how it will sound. And it's, it's really impressive and emotional for me. Yeah. I can imagine. It's more than, than you hope, maybe. Yeah, and, and this context yes. where everything is coming together, it's really... I could not imagine it could be better than this. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> then a question to bring you back to reality, because there is a technical question. There's the Bishop of Rotterdam, and I heard he was a pupil in your music lessons. Did you know that? Yes, yes. We, we just had to, uh, a little talk about that. It was in 76, I think. And uh, we just talked about the Beatles, because we were singing the Beatles at that time at the classroom. And, uh, and we were talking about the family, who was a musical family. And several members of the family I know were my pupils. And it, it was really fine that we, we kept along uh, our contacts, Hans, I, I really appreciate it that you are here today. Thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Victor. <laughs> and now for an introduction in governance and refugees, I'd like to meet you the Deputy Mayor of the City of Groningen, Matthias Gijsbertsen. This is always the case with me. And I get the hang of it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the city of Groningen, which is my pleasure to welcome you. I'm sure you won't mind if I extend a special welcome to Dr. Pietro Bartolo. Dr. Bartolo, we are delighted to have you here with us today. We are touched that you are here in the Martini Kerk you have taken to heart the plight of all those who wash ashore, and they literally wash ashore at Lampedusa. Compassion is not an empty slogan for a city whose most important and best known church, this one, is named after St. Martin. It's necessary to share our good fortunes with those who are less fortunate than ourselves. Now, every day on the, 5th of no on the 11th of November, we celebrate the Feast of St. Martin here today, here in the city. And these days, it's mainly for the children. Uh, it's with lanterns and songs and especially a lot of sweets. But still, uh, it's not just some kind of festival one time in, the, in every year. Uh, it has an obligation that comes with it, being the city of St. Martin. And of course, the question is, what can we do? And shortly I would like to quote from Isaiah. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with, with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. It's a text that still applies today and ultimately it means that there should be room for everybody that everyone should count, be able to join in, that no one is left by the wayside, that no one is excluded, but everyone is included. Now, there is no lack of exclusion in Europe's history. It's a history filled with division, with nationalism, with strife, war, refugees. But there's also a more recent history of cooperation and peace building. But I must say that you get the feeling that it grows more fragile every day instead of growing stronger. Because still, we allow ourselves to accept human suffering where we could do so much more 
to fight it. And I wonder what did our continent learn from that history? We see those pictures of people at sea in rickety boats, endless queues in the freezing cold at the borders of Europe. And closer to home, the heated and sometimes disgusted, disgusting scenes that play out when a municipality talks about setting up a rece reception center for refugees. Such was not the case in Groningen, luckily. Migration is a phenomenon of all ages. The sheer scale of today's migration flows will not leave Western Europe untouched. Each week, thousands of people are seeking protection and shelter. Amnesty International recently announced that there are 21 million refugees in the world today. To be clear, most of them are seeking protection in their own region. The Italian Coast Guard announced this week that in a 48-hour period, they had rescued more than 10,000 migrants from the sea and brought them to shore. On Monday, about 6,000 migrants were rescued from some 40 boats, an all-time record, or rather, a heartbreaking low point. A day later, a further 4,655 people were rescued. And I cannot imagine the sights that Mr. Bartolo must have seen. It's unfathomable to see so many people, hundreds of thousands, every day, in all their individual circumstances. And sometimes I'm happy to hear as well that there's sometimes a glimmer of hope because of the things you can do. This year, half a million refugees are, are expected to reach Europe. The arrival of so many immigrants will create a change, will bring change to Europe and to the Netherlands. Now, there's a richness in cultural and religious differences, but they do change the immediate and familiar world around us. And they can lead to tensions if we stop communicating. It is up to local government, politicians, teachers, parents, to explain that things will change, that they stand behind these changes, and especially keep the conversation going. The award that the Inlia Foundation is presenting today to the mayor of Lampedusa and to all residents of the island amounts to a major appeal for a society made up of invisible threads that bind people together. And that is so very important. It was already memor uh, uh, memorized by a couple of people who uh, uh, said that Pope Francis made his very first visit to Lampedusa. And for many people that visit was a wake-up call. Pope Francis appealed for more solidarity. And at the same time, he criticized people's indifference and lack of responsibility. He abhorred the fact that in this globalizing world, we have made indifference a global phenomenon. We have become accustomed to other people's suffering. Sometimes it doesn't touch us, it doesn't interest us, or it isn't our responsibility. The globalization of indifference needs the response of people leading by example, by compassionate example. And that's why the work of residents of the island for a compassionate society is so important. Through their selfless efforts, the people of Lampedusa have made a tremendous contribution to a more humane world, a world in which refugees are seen first and foremost as people, people in need, in search of hope, in search of a better future. For all the people who have lent assistance on Lampedusa, we, the countries of Western Europe, can only show the greatest respect. The people of Lampedusa continue to concern themselves with those who are seeking a better place. They have only limited resources, but they are an example of solidarity. It is therefore only right that today they should receive the Living Stone Award from the Inlia Foundation. You have held up a mirror to us. You have set aside your indifference through decisive action. And in do doing so, you have broken through the silence and indifference. Now I'd like to leave you with a text from Hebrews, which served as an inspiration for Bach's music and indirectly, I think, also for the great piece of music that we heard just now. 
Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Who knows how many angels the people of Lampedusa have since shown hospitality to. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor of the City of Kronia, Matthias Gijswetzer. He was talking about the living stone, but actually we should talk about the living stones. Because earlier this month, uh, Jan van Heusingveld, laureate and member of the board of the Inlia Foundation, went to Lampedusa with in his suitcase a second living stone to be given to the Honorable Mayor of Lampedusa, and her name is Giussi Nicolini. Sindaco Nicolini, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for welcoming us to the beautiful island of Lampedusa. On behalf of the India Foundation, I would like to present you and the people of Lampedusa with the Livingstone Awards as here presented. India is founded 28 years ago as an international network of religious communities. Its main purpose is to shelter those who have fled their home their home countries and are in need for a safe place to live. With thousands of refugees crossing the Mediterranean, Lampedusa is confronted with a tremendous challenge to provide them shelter, basic needs, and a safe passage into Europe. This living stone has its origin in the Bible. Jesus was chosen by God as a cornerstone for building a spiritual and peaceful community. It is assigned to individuals community or organizations that has shown a remarkable commitment towards helping refugees. This award represents courage, it represents uh, breaking down walls instead of building fences, and it represents compassion. You, as the mayor of Lampedusa, have shown the world great leadership in welcoming refugees who have risked their lives in search for a better future. Your determination has proven to be an example to all of us. You show us what humanity truly means. And for this, I will present you the Livingstone Award. Sono io che ringrazio voi perché ci avete onorato di un riconoscimento importantissimo della vostra visita, della vostra presenza, della vostra attenzione, ma di un premio che non è solo bello, ma è molto importante con la vostra attenzione, con la vostra visita, perché questo premio non è solo muovere, ma è una grande responsabilità per noi. Every time that we think on the role that Lampedusa has, we think, for, for example, together with my co-worker, with our people, well, we think, well, finally we're doing whatever is normal, whatever everybody would do. We're helping people who die because they're drowning or because they are suffocated. And we're helping people who would do anything just because they are seeking help. And then we uh, take into consideration what's going on today in Northern Europe or in other places uh, of our country. And we must recognize that not everybody uh, does normal things or things that are considered as normal. For example, recognize the sacredness of human life, recognize the sacredness of human rights rights. Uh, not everybody understands that uh, building walls, sending uh, away these people, using weapons to send them away is something that it's just not uh, fair. We have seen terrible images of children killed, of children sent away, and this is something that Lampedusa has never done, uh, not only because we are in the middle of the sea and the sea belongs to everyone. The sea, thank God, cannot contain any wall. 
But I would like to say that our island is in the middle of two continents. We are in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. We have been put there by history or by geography. We don't know which providence put us in this position. But our role is to be a port for those who sail and we must be a welcoming port. So I would like to thank you because in this way we can all do everything we can to help Lampedusa show that welcoming people is something that not only is possible to be done, but it's something that can help us to come out of emergency. That it's something that is very important. And, and actually, you know what? This year we had 36 more tourists who came to Lampedusa, probably because they wanted to reward us or they wanted to show their solidarity and probably they just wanted to reward us for welcoming these foreigners, these migrants, or maybe just because Lampedusa is a very beautiful island. But we must speak out, we must say everything because being afraid is extremely stupid. And to be honest, if we could do it, if, if Lampedusa, a such small island, could do what we have done, well, I think if we work all together in solidarity, I think we can really achieve much more. Thank you very much. Sindaco Nicolini. First of all, I would like to thank you. Dagmari Jimmer. It's a difficult name. It's the name of a man who arrived one day in Lampedusa. He's originally from Ethiopia. Uh, now, years later, he is a respected filmmaker in Italy. Let's hear what he has to say. Vorrei iniziare il mio intervento più che altro un una riflessione da fare insieme. I would like to say something. I would like with a, to start with a thought. Well, actually, I would like to start with the words of the mayor of Lampedusa, Miss Giuse Nicolini. She says, no one ever died by welcoming people. Well, many people are tired, many people Oh, would probably never see foreigners arrive in Europe. So the thought I would like to share with you, and I would like everybody to think about that, is why? Why these people leave their country? Why do we start such a dramatic and difficult trip? Well, we do it because there is war, because there are dictators who want more power. We leave our country because there is no social justice. We flee our country because the World Bank is destroying our economy. We leave our land because multinationals take our farmer's land and so many governments do uh, work within this exploiting mechanism. So I'm wondering how many of us could, for example, avoid to buy cheap products which come from exploiting other human beings. So what I would like to say is this is not only a problem of uh, developing countries, Asia, Africa. This is a global problem that pushes people to move from one place to the other. No one would ever want to start such a trip. No one would ever leave their native land. So why a family does that? Why do parents put their children on a boat? Is this because they don't care? Well, I don't think so. I hope that this tradition of welcoming other people will remain so. This is a civil act that history will recognize in the future. 
whatever we pass on to our children, it's the most important thing. I was there. I have been welcoming people. I have remained human. Goodbye. I introduce to you the General Secretary of CCME, the Church's Commission for Migrants in Europe, Mrs. Doris Peschke. telepathic speech, but it will be with a microphone. Thank you very much. You. Lampedusa, that is what we have heard already, is not only a place of too many shipwrecks and too many deaths in, at sea. It is also a place and a vivid reminder of humane and humanitarian responses to the world's refugee crisis. It doesn't stand alone, but it is a symbol of other places, other islands in the Mediterranean, be they in Greece, in the Aegean, be it Malta, be it other places. But Lampedusa is unique in the way that it really responded very, very well. More than half of the refugees worldwide are children. Children who experienced war and violence, vulnerabilities, both back at home and also on their way to safety. They experience separation of families. They sometimes may not understand why some relatives are no longer around to play with them. They experience anxiety of their parents. And yet, despite this experience, they also play in the places like Idomeni, in Lampedusa, we have seen some of the pictures. They develop hope. They come together, learn, and this is what we now hear also in songs and poems by children of their stories. And this is performed by children here from this city. So it also shows how children connect with their stories of those less fortunate and those more fortunate. They are building a bridge in this world and these bridges we desperately need all over the world. So this sign of hope, I would also ask whether we can replicate this to reach out to places like Capitan Andrevo in Bulgaria, some of the Greek islands, Lesbos, Samos. Can we find other schools which also partner with refugee children to create the space which they need to grow together so that indeed we make space for the children to be the future of this world. Thank you. Thank you. Let's listen to some voices of the future. These are the high school students of the Martins College in the Hare and take a good look, there might be a future bishop among them. They are going to sing a wonderful song. It's uh, the translation of this song from Cecilia. Is a land that doesn't hear. On the piano, we find a piano player with a wonderful name, Giacomo Caruso, from Sicily, conducted by Lisbeth Pettens. Give them a big applause. Looking 
Voices of the Future. Martin's College, beautiful school in Groningen. A few more Voices of the Future, and then we will go and uh, see the, how the living stone has been handed over. We go to Lampedusa. Three children, a few children of the school in Lampedusa, they uh, recite three poems. You find a translation in your book. Sono le onde. In estate i bambini fanno giocare, in inverno tutti fanno disperare. Certe volte sono un po' capricciose e non hanno pietà. A chi vuole approdare non danno stabilità. Molte persone ripongono nel mare la propria speranza perché della loro vita ne hanno abbastanza. Uomini, donne e bambini si lanciano all'avventura con gli occhi pieni di paura. Da guerra e crudeltà stanno scappando, pace e libertà vanno cercando. Molte volte il nostro mare è stato generoso, facendoli approdare per trovare riposo. Mare grande, sei una madre che culla i suoi figli e li aiuta a cercare nuovi appigli. Mare Nostrum lo chiamavano i romani ed è la nuova finestra aperta sul domani. Tu, mare, con le tue acque limpide e cristalline, sei come un velo che avvolge tutta l'umanità. Tu, mare, mare pieno di vita, mare di incontri, mare di sogni che ora si avverano, ora finiscono in un naufragio pieno di sfide e sofferenze. Tu, mare, mare che accogli molte vite innocenti, persone uguali a noi alla ricerca di felicità e libertà. Tu, mare, mare bello, grande, furbetto, giocherellone, a volte tanto entusiasta da diventare persino pericoloso. Tu, mare, mare di episodi, mare di sentimenti, mare di ricordi, mare di vite. Tu, immagine della fratellanza. 
Ma faccia alla finestra e vedo il mare. Brilla le stelle, tremano le onde. Un guizzo chiama, un palpito risponde. Il cielo è chiaro, la luna luce in fonde. Ecco, sospira l'acqua, alita il vento. Sul mare è apparso un bel ponte d'argento. Ponte che unisce paesi lontani e che raggruppa insieme tanti esseri umani. The Voices of the Future. Anna Luyten, who works as a journalist at Vrij Nederland, it's a weekly news magazine in Holland, she wrote an impressive story about the doctor of Lampedusa, Pietro Bartolo, an introduction to a very special man. Please welcome Anna Luyten. A few decades ago, this happens. There was at that moment no school in Lampedusa as we saw now. It was a kind of lottery as a weapon against misery. The father said to his children, I can only send one of you on a boat to a better life. Only one of you can study. So the poor fisherman wrote the names of his children on a little paper and all of them are waiting because one of them, but only one of them, could have a better future. And the father read the name and he said, Pietro, Pietro. Pietro Bartolo had always walked bare feet. But from that moment on, from the moment that his father sent him on a boat to Sicily, to a better future, to study, to a school, everything changed. For the first time, he felt some leather near his feet, and he walked into another life. He was a very, very, very good student. He fell in love in Sicily and he became a doctor. And now, Dr. Pietro Bartolo is a medical miracle. Not that he had a disease that most people don't survive, no, he is, and I think together with all the people of Lampedusa, a medicine, the best medicine for a deadly catastrophe, a catastrophe that's threatening us everywhere, a catastrophe that's called cynicism, hopelessness, and despair. Dr. Bartolo, I met you for the first time, I think, 14 years ago, and dear people, the first thing I saw was his big hands. I saw these big hands, hands that were made for delivering babies and giving new life to this world. And at that moment, when I saw Dr. Bartolo there on this beautiful island full of generous people of Lampedusa, he was shaking his hands to heaven because he was on what I call the fatal coastline of Europe the fatal coastline of Europe that's called Lampedusa. For more than 25 years, Pietro Bartolo has been ready waiting at the quay of Lamp Lampedusa when the refugees arrive. He has seen all of the 300,000 refugees, dead and alive. He felt their pulse. He looked for diseases. He saved them. He put them in body bags. He collected DNA material. He helped their children getting born, talked to them, comforted them. Last year, Dr. Pietro Bartolo said, a man never gets used to misery. I see them, all those people, when I sleep and when I am awake. The dark, frightened eyes in the night of men, of women, 
of children sent by destiny, fighting against destiny. The humankind blown away by the winds. And would, what do they say on the continent? Let them be blown away. Send them back. Keep the gates shut. And Dr. Bartolo said, we have to continue to welcome refugees. We have to continue to welcome people who are looking for a better life, for a better future. In the same time, we have to stop migration. He is not naive, but he said, we have to stop building walls because the higher the wall, the higher people will climb and the deeper they will fall. Dr. Bartolo, you touched all those bodies of strangers, and strangers became people. Dr. Bartolo and dear people of Lampedusa, dear generous people, you saw terrible things. But when we look at you, and when we look at you, dear people of Lampedusa, we see also the strength the strength of big hands, the strength of mankind, the strength of open arms. Thank you. Anna Leiter. Heel mooi, heel mooi. It's a great honor for me to now call up on the stage the doctor of Lampedusa. Il dottore Pietro Bartolo. Please come to the stage and uh, I will also introduce to you the director of the Inlia Foundation, John van Tilburg. Dear doctor, dear friend, there is not much that I can add to all the great words that are spoken already over here. But there are two things I want to say. First, I will never forget when you were telling from your experiences of doing your job, and much more than your job, being human, towards people in need. How you were in the darkness of the belly of the ship, how you buried a woman who just had a child. I was still connected with the baby through the string. And I saw the tears in your eyes telling about this. There was not a doctor speaking to me. There was an example speaking to me that I think is an example to all of us. Anna Leiter just said, you touched many people. You touched many people to cure them, to heal them, and to identify them, to make sure who they were, find their tattoos, to register as the only coroner on the island. Hundreds of them, young and old. You touched the bodies of refugees, the dead and the life and the living. And let me tell you, I'm so very proud that my board asked me to hand over the living stone to you because you, don't, you didn't only touch them, you, you're touching all of us. And I hope that the touching that you're doing to us today and to many others before, that that will continue because you're the living example that it can be done differently. And you're representative of a proud and, and, and honest people, and, a bra and brave people, people who are working through your words when you're stating, we welcome what the sea is bringing us. And so therefore, I would like to, and I'm very proud that I am allowed to, present to you 
the living stone, um, awarded to Dr. Pietro Bartolo, an example to all of us, representing the spirit of the people of Lampedusa towards refugees and towards us. Dr. Friend. Yes. We will listen to Il Dottore, and the, uh, the translation of what he is saying is in your book. Don't forget to look at him. <laughs> Buonasera a tutti. Buonasera. Me lo dico col cuore. E vorrei iniziare ringraziando intanto la Fondazione Ilia per aver scelto Lampedusa come destinataria di questo illustre riconoscimento. E me, in qualità di suo rappresentante. In nome della comunità che rappresento, rivolgo un sincero saluto a tutte le autorità civili e religiose qui riunite. È ammirevole, veramente ammirevole, l'impegno mostrato dalla Fondazione Ilia nell'offrire assistenza e concreto aiuto a tutti coloro che richiedono asilo. Sono tante brave persone. Tutti i giorni sulla mia isola, Lampedusa, siamo impegnati nell'accogliere quanti, versando in condizioni disperate, cercano un futuro migliore. E per me è un piacere immenso sapere che, al di là della prima accoglienza che siamo noi, ci sono persone che lavorano con serietà per garantire un'adeguata integrazione ai richiedenti asilo. Quindi, anche a distanza, e anche se è tanta la distanza, è possibile mettere insieme le proprie forze e così in sinergia, insieme, offrire un futuro più stabile e sereno a chi ha bisogno. Noi siamo la porta d'Europa, voi siete la casa d'Europa. We are the Europe's door, but you are Europe's house. Vorrei ricordare la tenacia mostrata dalle sorelle dell'Ordine dello Spirito Santo di Chinivinizza, Chinista, le quali hanno aperto le porte ai bisognosi d'aiuto, degno di ammirazione e l'impegno da loro mostrato nelle vicende che ebbero inizio nel 2013, un anno da ricordare. Ilia ha mostrato in tal occasione di, di, la volontà di offrire appoggio e sostegno perché si potesse giungere a una soluzione concreta tenendo sempre bene a mente che dietro a tali contrasti, a tali contrasti ci sono persone cariche di difficoltà la cui unica speranza è conquistare migliori condizioni di vita e proprio nel 2013 lo stesso anno a Lampedusa si è consumata una fra le più grandi tragedie dell'umanità come ricorderete, 368 persone, parlo di persone, dicevano che erano 366, sono 368, perché due persone in più sono due persone, non due numeri. 
I would like to underline that these are persons. So as you will remember, 368 people died. And I will remember these are persons because they thought there were 366, but no, it's 368. And two more, it matters because the, these are two lives, two persons. Morirono il 3 di ottobre, me lo ricordo bene quel giorno, cercando di raggiungere le coste di Lampedusa e non ce l'hanno fatta. Erano a pochi metri dalla costa di Lampedusa, dal porto di Lampedusa. Non hanno potuto raccontare le loro storie. These people died uh, very close to Lampedusa shores. They tried to reach our shores, but they didn't make it. They just were seeking help, nothing else, but they didn't make it. Volevano raggiungere l'Europa continente da loro sognato nel quale dare inizio a una nuova vita, vita che gli è stata negata nei loro paesi. È stato un evento disastroso che ha visto tutta la popolazione dell'isola impegnata nel dare il proprio contributo. In quell'occasione furono salvate 159 persone che i lampedusani hanno prontamente accolto nella loro casa offrendo loro vestiti, cibo, ma soprattutto affetto, perché è quello che vogliono, non vogliono altro, non vogliono vivere da ricchi, vogliono sopravvivere e vivere dignitosamente. All these people are looking for is help a dignified life and love. They do not demand anything else. And that's what people from Lampedusa is trying to offer these people. Il popolo di Lampedusa, come dico sempre io, è un popolo di pescatori, un popolo di mare, e tutto quello che viene dal mare è benvenuto. Sostengo e ne sono fermamente convinto che aiutare chi ha bisogno sia un dovere di ogni uomo che possa essere chiamato uomo. Every man has the duty of helping other people if this person wants to be called a man. Io e Lampedusani da 25 anni viviamo questo fenomeno dell'immigrazione. Vogliamo un fenomeno non un problema. Immigration for us is a phenomenon, that's how I call it. It is not a problem, as many others call it. Cercando di fare tutto il possibile senza mai arrendersi, mai, anche nei momenti difficili. E credetemi, di momenti difficili ne abbiamo, ce ne sono stati tanti, ma c'è non di meno, non ci siamo mai tirati indietro. Non abbiamo mai eretto muri, recinti, barriere o fili spinati. Abbiamo sempre accolto tutti e lo faremo sempre fino alla morte. Negli anni passati Lampedusa ha affrontato da sola questa epocale emergenza umanitaria. All'indomani della strage di Lampedusa il governo italiano ha voluto fortemente introdurre un nuovo sistema di salvataggio e di recupero dei migranti, denominato Mare Nostrum. Successivamente si sono associati anche altri paesi europei, giungendo alla nascita di Frontex, che è un'agenzia che coordina le operazioni di pattugliamento nel Mediterraneo delle frontiere, ma di fatto essa svolge anche attività di salvataggio assimilabile a quelle di Mare Nostrum. I migranti pertanto vengono recuperati vicino alle coste africane, nell'intento di evitare che si compiano ancora stragi. Dal 1 gennaio ad oggi sono state tratte in salvo circa 100.000 persone, uomini, donne, bambini, ma nonostante questa azione lodevole, importante, umana. Purtroppo 
ancora oggi in quel piccolo tratto di mare che resta continuano a naufragare e morire tante persone magari mentre noi stiamo parlando in questo momento tanti bambini stanno morendo Many people unfortunately continue to die in this small part of sea and probably while we are here talking there are many people dying in this very moment. Durante tutti questi anni di attività ho sempre tenuto ben chiaro nella mia mente che dietro ogni migrante, dietro ogni persona, lungi da me da considerarlo un numero come spesso accade purtroppo, si cela un'esperienza di vita con tutti i suoi drammi, le sue sofferenze, le sue storie fatte di torture, violenze, sevizie. Le donne, che sono quelle che pagano di più, sono loro, vengono tutte violentate. E quando arrivano, io le vedo, le faccio l'ecografia e spesso non ne vogliono parlare perché non vogliono far sapere che sono violentate perché nella loro cultura, se i parenti sanno che sono state violentate, vengono pure ripudiate. These people come with stories of human tragedies. And unfortunately, well, there are many stories I could tell you, but this is not the time and the place. But there, there is one for all that I would like to say. Women, as usual, are the ones who in these situations pay the highest price. All women are always raped. And when they arrive at shore in Lampedusa, i have to do the medical check and I see these women and some of them arrive and they're pregnant and if they're not pregnant I ask them to speak about what they've been through but they will not talk about it because they're ashamed of it because in their culture if they're raped not only they have been raped but they're sent away from their family e quello che molte cose non si sanno è che le donne che non sono incinte, che non arrivano gravide, non è perché non sono state violentate, ma perché vengono sottoposte a delle terapie ormonali con dei progestinici che le mettono in menopausa per non rimanere incinte. Perché una donna incinta per loro non vale neanche un centesimo. And what you need to know is that the women who are not pregnant after having been raped, if they're not pregnant, is because they uh, have, they, they're administrated a medical treatment before they leave their countries, which is a progesterone treatment. So it's a hormonal change. So they have the menopause, uh, early menopause, and they cannot be pregnant and the reason for this is because for them a pregnant woman is basically useless if the woman is pregnant they they cannot use her in any other way when she arrives in the target country e questo è niente and this is nothing compared to all the stories that i've lived vorrei adesso ancora ringraziare comunque la Fondazione Ilia, per avermi dato questa opportunità di essere oggi qui. E mi sento onorato di ciò, ed è mio desiderio approfittare di questa occorrenza per formulare un appello destinato a tutta l'Europa. E questo voglio che la traduci in diretta. Certo. I'm here, I would like to make uh, an appeal to everyone quello che ho detto, che voglio sì. approfittare di questo per un appello. E l'appello è questo. Tutta l'Europa, 
cerchiamo di mostrarci sempre umani nei confronti di questi nostri fratelli. Come ci insegnava, come ci insegna attraverso il suo segno, il suo esempio, il nostro Papa Francesco. Egli, con mirabile forza, ha affermato che i migranti sono, non sono un pericolo, no, sono in pericolo. E animati di queste parole, dobbiamo sentire come un vero dovere l'accoglienza. Dobbiamo sentirci come delle pietre vive. Noi dobbiamo sentirci delle pietre vive che debbono sostenere un edificio ricco di amore, solidarietà e misericordia. So my appeal to Europe is today that we should show our humanity towards our brothers and sisters. As His Holiness Pope Francis once said when he came to Lampedusa, he said, we must be strong because migrants are not dangerous for us, but they are in danger and therefore we must help them. So motivated by these words, we must feel our responsibility, we must welcome them, we must to be feeling all of us like living stones, we must build love, solidarity and help around these people. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you. What a moment. To the world, I say thank you for joining us. En tegen jullie wil ik iets anders zeggen. Het was een lange zit. En we zijn allemaal tot op het bot verkleumd. Maar wat is dat vergeleken met wat deze mensen hebben meegemaakt. Dank je wel.
the young and talented Mr. Caruso from Sicily. Met deze heerlijke klanken zijn we aan het einde van deze bijeenkomst gekomen. Heerlijk dat jullie er waren en wellicht tot ziens. En deze bijeenkomst gaat nog wel even nawerken, denk ik. Dank u zeer.